The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we got a full house today. Who do we have we with a us? Full house. We are delighted to welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast Lindsay Francis, who is a researcher. In, and program coordinator in uh, Palliative Care Research Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Lindsay. Thank you. And it's Lindsay Bell. Sorry. Lindsay Bell. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Francis is my middle name, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, usually we straighten that out beforehand. My mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> and Tessie October, who is a pediatric palliative care physician first pediatric palliative care physician on the Jerry Powell podcast and a critical care physician at Children's National in DC. Welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast, Tessie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Peds rocks. Peds rocks. <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, we have uh, Reba Kelsey, who is a family medicine physician in Atlanta at Morehouse, which is... Uh, uh, one of the historically black uh, colleges uh, and universities uh, in, in the United States. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Reba. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we're going to be talking about um, and the framing around a recent uh, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, JPSM paper, on the lack of exposure to palliative care training for black residents, a study of schools with the highest and lowest percentages of black enrollment. This is an absolutely fascinating paper. Um, uh, Lindsay was the first author. Tessie was the, the senior author. Love to get into that. But before we do, we always have a song request. Lindsay, I think you got the song request this time around. I do. So our song request is going to be Run the World by Beyonce. And we chose this because Beyonce, I don't know if anyone's seen the Netflix special, but she pays homage to HBCUs, which is a large part of our paper. Um, and HBCU we have three ladies. HBCU stands for the Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Yes. And we have three ladies from our team joining us today, so we thought it was appropriate. <laughs> and also to torture me, <laughs> female diva singer-songwriters, which I'm pretty far from, but it's all fun. Here we go, just a little bit. Who? Who runs the world? Who runs the world? Girls. Who runs the world, girls? 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 Some of them men think they freak this like we do, but they don't. Make your check them at thy neck. Disrespect us, no they won't. Boy, don't even try to touch this. Boy, the speed is crazy. This is how they made me. Houston, Texas, baby. Who runs the world, girls? 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 <laughs> Wow. Nicely done, Alex. <laughs> that was pretty good. I, I I have to say that I was not expecting that. Yeah, yeah, that was that was great. <laughs> I was I was gonna I was at a joke about Beyonce could probably keep her job. Like, yeah, you're not gonna take it over. But you know, that was that was pretty darn good. <laughs> I think Beyonce is still pretty safe though. So I think so. <laughs> so let's let's start off. Um, talking about this paper. Um, uh, we usually do, before we even jump into the paper, how you, how you got interested in this subject. So I'm going to start off with uh, Lindsay. How did you get interested in this, as this is a potential research project for you? So in my role as research project coordinator, um, I am working on a project that partners with Howard University, Morehouse School of Medicine, which is how I met Reba, and then the University of Puerto Rico to implement a palliative care educational intervention. And so importantly, um, Howard and Morehouse are both HBCUs and the University of Puerto Rico is a predominantly Latinx serving institution. So it was interesting that these, you know, three kind of major institutions that serve underrepresented students didn't have palliative care training. So we were curious to know what the state of this type of training looked like at other institutions that serve predominantly underrepresented students. And so for myself, you know, I was aware of the disparities that exist in palliative care, and I was learning more about the issues in the workforce um, with diversity. And so was curious to know what factors that might 
contribute to these issues are found in the medical education system. Hmm. And uh, Tessie, how about you? How did you get interested in this as a pediatric yeah. palliative care doctor, critical <laughs> care? Yeah, I mean, when Lindsay came to me with the idea, I was like, this is this is something we have to do, right? Um, so I teach communication skills as a consultant with Vital Talk, and your audience mm-hmm. will know Vital Talk, right? It's mm-hmm. one of the platforms, I would say probably one of the gold standard platforms out there that teaches communication skills uh, to clinicians who are taking care of patients who have serious illness. Um, and, you know, as a facilitator, I'm constantly struck by the lack of diversity in the facilitator pool. Um, Mm. And I know this lack of diversity is equally present in the clinical setting. So not only do we have not have black clinicians teaching this material, we also don't have black clinicians at the bedside. And we know from the literature that race matters, right? Um, Mm. And that racism exists, that racial concordance matters that patients are more comfortable with doctors who look like them. They're more likely to report their symptoms, more likely to be compliant with their medications and so on and so forth um, when they're communicating with a doctor who looks like them. So it made me sad to sort of think about Mm -hmm. the fact that me, a black woman, that you know, many patients who look like me may never have the experience of connecting with a black physician while they're at their most vulnerable times dealing with, you know, serious illness. Um, and so it became important to me to think of where is the problem? Is it that where in the pipeline are we not recruiting palliative care physicians who are black and, and, uh, and brown people? Mm-hmm. And, and Reba, in, in your experiences as an educator and a clinician, is this something that also kind of resonates you as far as the palliative care workforce and the lack of diversity in it? Sure, absolutely. And, um, and that's exactly it. You know, as a clinician and as an educator and as an administrator, I direct the family medicine residency program. So curriculum is, you know, is very important to me and, you know, kind of how we build out our curriculum. So understanding first that there is underutilization of palliative care services among African-Americans and, um, and, and Latino uh, uh, persons. And then secondly, understanding, well, wow, you know, we are here at an institution where we're training um, people who will ultimately likely be the ones who are going to take care of patients who are from that um, that population. And not only that, at an institution where our goal is to help to eliminate um, health, health, health inequities. So, um, so with that and understanding that as people understand and know better and develop the skills, they have greater self-efficacy and are therefore going to be more likely to utilize, um, you know, um, that a particular skill. So if it's in this case, we're talking about palliative care. So all of those things were kind of in my mind as, um, as the idea of the paper was, was, uh, was brought to me. And I said, well, it'd be really important for us to understand what the scope of this is across other institutions so that as we can sit, uh, start to think about uh, solutions, then we can kind of have a sense of where, where our starting point is. So that's really what the interest was for me. Mm-hmm. And then Lindsay, for, Let's let's briefly talk about the the paper. Um, what did you what did you try to do in this paper? What was the question? So and we'll have a link to the paper in our show notes on the Jerry Powell website. So if you're interested, um, you can pull up the paper. Yeah. So in this paper, like Reba mentioned, we wanted to see what the scope of palliative care training was, um, particularly at institutions that had the highest rate of Black medical student enrollment, Mm -hmm. and then also see what that looked like at schools that had the lowest rate of enrollment to understand if there was some sort of difference between those groups of institutions. So we basically just did kind of um, basic internet searches. We communicated with representatives at these institutions to evaluate kind of across um, all phases of medical training if there was palliative care offered at those institutions. And can I ask, what did you find? So we found, um, first of all, we, we looked at all of the HBCUs that have a medical program. Um, and there, there are four of those in the US. And so none of the HBCUs that had a medical program incorporated palliative care training in their medical school or residency curricula. Um, they also didn't have hospice and palliative medicine fellowship programs. And then among the institutions that had the highest rate of black medical student enrollment, we found that 
their residency, um, family medicine and internal medicine residency programs were less likely to offer palliative care training when compared to institutions that had lower rates of black medical student enrollment. Hmm. And then um, again, when you're just, when you're looking at top versus bottom uh, uh, medical student enrollment, um, do we have also an idea of, I'm guessing that correlates fairly also well with residency um, enrollment. Is that right? Or do we know anything about that? I am not sure, honestly. It's hard to yeah. find um, you know, data on race and ethnicity within each residency program. Yeah. Um, so we basically based it off of what we knew about their medical school. And then from there, we're able to select um, the institutions that we looked at. Tessie, did this surprise you? No, unfortunately, it didn't, right? Um, I would say... I was just trying to think back of when did you get excited in medical school yeah. about a about a subject, right? And when yeah. do you get that? When do you know that you're going to be a surgeon or you're going to be yeah. a pediatrician? It's those experiences that our black uh, students aren't even getting exposed to our field. So mm-hmm. how do they even know that we exist? Yeah, I mean, I think back to my own training. It was really. FaceTime with faculty members who served as role models that got me interested in both geriatrics and palliative care. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that kind of motivated me and mentored me to go into this field. And like, if you don't have those people, you may not even know the field exists. Mm -hmm. Right. We're such a young field uh, to begin with. And we are really nice people, palliative care, especially palliative care <laughs> pediatricians. <laughs> you should meet they some don't of get us to meet palliative us. care geriatricians too, <laughs> like the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> Reba, hey. any thoughts from you about these findings? Yeah, I mean, like Tessie, they were not particularly surprising to me. Um, you know, they we were aware that uh, within medical schools, within residencies, that there are low, you know, percentages of of African Americans um, in those training spaces anyway. And then, so when you get into the specialty spaces um, and the ability to, as you mentioned, see others who are doing palliative care and teaching palliative care, um, that we already we know that 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 lack exists. And we know that medical students, as just as you said, I mean, when you see someone who is doing someone who you, who you can see yourself becoming doing a thing, then you take an interest in that thing. In this case, um, a specialty area or in this, mm-hmm. you know, or as we're talking about palliative yeah. care. So I would say that it didn't particularly surprise yeah. me. Now, you know, somebody could briefly look over this um, and without even thinking, say, Oh my gosh, like, yeah, these historically black colleges and universities, these medical programs in them, they don't have palliative care. They should do a better job. And that feels like not the conclusion we should be taking here. And I'm wondering as we think about this paper and we think about how, what can we do as a field? uh, Maybe we can go individuals and as a field to make change, to make it better. Again, I, I'm guessing you're not going to say, oh, these HBPCUs should do better and uh, I don't have to worry about this here at UCSF. Yeah, no, I think, you know, certainly um, that you're right. I mean, there, there are those who will look, read the paper and say exactly that, but it's not that simple of mm-hmm. an issue. Uh, and it's starts with, you know, what we what we discussed in terms of the exposure. So you remember that faculty members are going to um, teach based in, up, upon their areas of specialty and their area of specialty is going to be based upon the exposures that they had. So mm-hmm. if you're having within a faculty um, people who may or may not have had exposure, um, we also want to think about that in uh, the HBCUs traditionally, the HBCU medical schools traditionally were centered around primary care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, increasing the increasing pri- primary care um, physician workforce. Um, as we expand into more specialty areas, then um, then we're seeing more, you know, those areas that we see like cardiology and things of that nature. But because just as Tessie was mentioning that there is um, a relative with palliative care being a relatively young field, then there's um, some uh, lack of awareness of it as a field and thinking too, that there are some physicians who in their personal lives have had experiences 
with family members or loved ones who've engaged with palliative care, perhaps at cases when in, in instances when it was was much later than they should have been introduced to it. And so then their perception may not have been as positive about palliative care. And so they've not taken on an interest. So there are so many layers, um, both from the individual um, patient level and then also kind of at the institutional level that um, that that I think is, is, is too far, too, too broad of an, an yeah. issue, too grand of an issue to say that it's just that they need to get it together. Now, what we yeah. can do is certainly and, you know, some of the part, part, like partnerships that we're, we're doing here with University of Pittsburgh, um, you know, certainly in changing funding priorities as it relates to building out capacity at HBCU medical schools and other medical schools that have large populations of um, of, med- of black medical students in, in terms of building out curriculum and space. Yeah. Could we hear more about the partnership with the University of Pittsburgh and what that's Sure. About? Yes. So we've been um, working with uh, with the University of Pittsburgh with uh, Dr. Bob Arnold and Lindsay mm-hmm. has been a part of this work. Um, Dr. October has been a part of the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so with it, we've um, we've been ha- we've been able to have exposure to um, lectures. Actually, Dr. Arnold just left us on Wednesday where he came and did a train the trainer session where he worked with faculty members on um, on delivering feedback. He's done another um, train the trainer session with us in terms of um, of teaching communication skills to to residents. And so we have a series of quarterly talks around various palliative care topics. So, you know, having a family meeting and things of that nature. There's also an arm of it that deals with um, with mentorship. So for those residents who've expressed an interest in in, pall- in hospice or palliative medicine, um, that's kind of providing them with mentorship. And in um, the scholarship around this work that we're doing, that certainly residents, faculty members, and medical students are able to be a part of that. Um, also connecting with resources, um, including the um, palliative care um, uh, um, organization that we've been able to get some training through. And so, um, so there's so it's kind of a multi it's a multifaceted approach to provide mm-hmm. exposure and education, both at the faculty level and the trainee level um, mm-hmm. that that we have been engaged in. And Lindsay may want to chime in a little more to give some other layers to that. Yeah, so I think um, you kind of nicely summarized it. I guess the goal of the project itself is to kind of build the infrastructure for um, the schools that we partner with to have a curriculum at the end that they can, you know, incorporate into their medical school and residency programs, um, you know, to make that available for their students. Yeah. And it's actually been really well received from our residents. Um, mm. You know, there are um, weekly topics that are sent, just very brief bits of information that are sent on everything from, um, you know, opiates you know, to dealing with delirium to dealing with. I mean, so there are various topics and given in very short bites that our residents are able to benefit from, residents and faculty, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a really amazing opportunity, especially for um, schools that may not have as much access if they have a high proportion of uh, Black students. Like That's what I'm hearing from this paper. I wonder what your thoughts are on the other schools that may have less enrollment um, of Black or underrepresented minorities. What should we be doing? Can I add that uh, I'll, I'll step in here just to yeah. say that that's part of the paper too, is that we're, our programs at HBCUs are, don't seem to have a lot of palliative care um, access or opportunities for people to get exposed to it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the um, folks who go on to, you know, from graduate from medical school, residency, and and so on, still aren't choosing palliative care. Our our black residents are still not choosing palliative care. Um, and the issue for me is a, is a bigger issue of pipeline issues of mm-hmm. uh, of having more black people actually be able to enter medical school. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot of that is the effects of systemic racism, Mm -hmm. um, that it starts from not not having access to STEM activities. It starts even earlier than that in terms of uh, neighborhood, right? The neighborhood effect and your ability to go to a a high-functioning school, um, all the grades and stuff that you need to advance in, in medical school 
um, and even the bias that we know that exists in the you know national testing. And so, and at every step of the way, black students are um, don't they exit the pipeline and don't finish, don't get to medical school. And then even once they get to medical school, they're still not choosing palliative care. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's there's an issue with majority serving institutions too of really trying to draw um, black residents into those fields. How do we get them engaged and excited about palliative medicine? Um, I usually say the magic wand <laughs> like thing like it, what 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 if we had a magic wand what would we change? I I'm going to move that way up from the end to, to now like getting very practical. Again, this is interview season for us right now in residency programs uh well, in fellowship programs, soon to be residency programs. Uh, let's start off with like fellowship programs. Um, as we think about this, and I even think to myself, I think a lot of fellowship programs think about um, uh, a commitment to palliative care. Like, do they have a long-standing commitment to palliative care? Have they done like research projects or QI projects on palliative care? Do the letter writers are they from you know palliative care um, backgrounds? Um, because we don't, you know, part of it is we don't want somebody who's has no exposure to go into a palliative care fellowship and realize, oh, I don't like this. And again, should and should we rethink how we're doing this based on what we're seeing here in this paper? Yeah, well, I think there's there's two parts to that. Um, so I think that certainly at, at this point, at the the point of of reviewing applications and and considering you know persons to interview and perhaps to um, rank for the programs, I think so. Um, you know, certainly casting a a broader net to one that may include a person that has not had the exposure, but has a compelling essay where you can kind of follow in their essay. And then you know better as you as you meet and, and, and interview them. Um, but it does require that um, a kind of a willingness to to look a little more more broadly. Um, but then just as as Tessie was mentioning, part of the solution to starts even before that point of reviewing an application. So, you know, what is the institution, what are the programs doing to reach out to perhaps high school students to um, for summer programs or for college students who have an interest in medicine and may not know about um, palliative care as a specialty and to provide research opportunities or even clinical opportunities for them. Um, so those are some of the things that can occur that will help to strengthen the pipeline Line, uh, really, of person, so that when you are then interviewing um, or reviewing applications, then there are more who have had experiences and yeah. exposures that maybe they wouldn't have had at a at the institution that they attended, or if with the magic wand, they will have had that exposure. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I, but I think the importance really is is giving some exposure earlier on and thinking about ways that you can engage uh, learners at earlier stages in their education. Yeah. I'll add that some people may hear what Reba said as, um, you know, expanding your vision of what a palliative care, a budding palliative care looks like, mm-hmm. might be seen as lowering your standards. And I just want to caution us to say that I think what she's saying is that we have to determine what our priorities are as a field. And if we're saying that as a field, it is beneficial to our patients to have physicians who look like them because they end up with more cultural sensitivity and receive better care and are more likely to accept palliative care services, Mm. then being Black alone is a priority. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying you lower your standards. I'm saying you widen your standards so that you see that as a value add, Mm -hmm. even if they may not have the same, um, you know, step one scores, uh, let's say, for example, Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's not going to impact patient care in the same way as them just coming in and being able to share those experiences with their patients. Yeah. And honestly, it sounds like we should be raising our standards. Like this is, this is, this is about raising our standards as a field and highlighting the importance of diversity. And I, I mean, I think back to what you were saying about Vital Talk and all of our programs that we do around education, if there's not diversity in that, our, we got terrible standards, right? Like, are we really teaching what we need to teach if it's um, you know, a bunch of people that look like me that come up with the curriculum? 
And that's right. that's terrible standards. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah and I'll tell ahead. you that at Vital Talk, we're actually doing something about it. Um, we've been really talking about how can we employ more cultural sensitivity when we don't have black facilitators, right? Mm -hmm. We still need to talk about racism. We still yeah. need, our patients are still talking about racism. The majority of black patients out there are going to be served by white physicians yeah. Yeah. or physicians who don't look like them. So mm -hmm. if you're asking what we can do now, we can improve the skill set of cultural sensitivity for our for mm -hmm. all physicians so that we lean into racism, talk about it, yeah. take an anti-racism approach, but mm -hmm. also really think about about how racism plays into the healthcare experience of our patients. Reba, I got a question for you as an administrator too. Um, you know, I think a lot of what we're trying to do here is think about the idea of holistic review. Like it's not just about one thing. We look at the entire application. Um, we actually have, uh, like in our geriatrics fellowship, a diversity committee that does holistic reviews in addition to the normal process for all. Um, uh, underrepresented um, um, populations. I also wonder because we then we ask these individuals uh, from underrepresented backgrounds to be on these committees, and then like the, in back of my mind too is I, I also think about like this minority tax that we put on them. How how do you think about all of this? And I'd love everybody else's thoughts too. Um, and again, at, um, at other institutions where there may be. Again, they're underrepresented, so there there may not be a lot of faculty members that are coming from those backgrounds. Right. Yeah. So so two parts. One in terms of the um, the holistic review of the of the application. Um, so certainly, I mean, of course, we know that we're looking at scores, we're looking at um, you know the numbers, but it's also important to look at what kind of service was the as the applicant engaged in what kind of leadership what mm -hmm. are they saying in their um in their their personal statement about their motivation for um in your in this case you know whether we're talking about geriatric care or palliative care specifically and so um so really kind of taking all of those things again going back to what the priorities are and what kind of a what kind of palliative care physician are you wanting to develop and so, um, so it's important then to consider what the substrate is. And so if you have a substrate that even with the, e even let's just say somebody who hasn't had the exposure yet, despite the, the exposure has sought out, um, you know, further training because they have an interest in it. Um, and, and, and to kind of tease out what is it that motivates them in terms of what they want to see happen differently with the patients that they're taking care of? Um, and that just has to be really part of the, um, the the evaluation of that application. Now it's on the applicant, of course, to 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 put to include something in the personal statement so it's enough for you to get gauged that you know to to, to have that interest and then to bring them in to talk to them further. Um, so there is that. Well, um, that's an interesting point because I. I've done a fair amount of of mentoring um, uh, individuals for like their personal statements, um, and uh, I have to say is that 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 there usually is. I, I'm not sure if there's also a differential kind of in what's happening with the the degree of mentorship um, from like small community programs, for example. I'm just going to stereotype this, but it seems after 15 years of doing this, like letters of recommendations from small community programs are usually much shorter than the letters of recommendations I get from top tier institutions. And less abusive, uh, even about uh, their best candidates. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so hard to know. And it, it can't just be about the candidate because it's a theme. <laughs> Right. 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 Um, yeah. So it it it's a it's a structural bias built into the system, and we see a lot of other these structural biases. Um, big institutions usually are kind of pushing back against internal uh, international medical graduates um, that are often much more diverse than U.S. medical graduates. Um, how should we be thinking about all of that too? And I'd love to hear from you. Like, how do you think about it in your own family medicine residency? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and that that last one that you mentioned is is tough because I mean there are pressures throughout the system to um, to rank more high, you know, to to focus on LCME graduates. 
So as you mentioned, you know, kind of the bias against, you know, foreign national grads, I mean, that's that's going to be or international uh, medical grads, you know, that's something that is throughout the, you know, system. And then, you, there, you know, where programs are concerned about, you know, if you have a high percentage of um, of international medical grads, then will you be seen, therefore, as a as a program that's not of as good quality? Because you know, for so there, so it, it runs yeah. both from the standpoint of how the the programs may see themselves, and then also oh. the way that they think that they may be seen by others. Now, for us, um, I, we we do look very broadly at the full application. Um, you know, we do look at the scores. You know, you you have to you have to do that. Um, but we also will look at those letters of recommendation. And, and to your point, um, there we I do notice a difference in letters of recommendation depending upon you know where they they are. Um, and so you ultimately it's it's really weighing those different parts of the application to see, you know, kind of as a whole, who yeah. is this person? And and there may be a person that you can you can really just see in the application that they just didn't have good letter writers. Yeah. Um, but you can see from other aspects of their of their um, application the the electives that they chose to do, you know, and kind of how they how they whether whether or not they discussed that. I mean, again, some of that comes out in the interview about what their thought process was yeah. around selecting certain electives. Um, but at the point of reviewing the application. Um, yeah, I mean, we just try to look at all aspects of it. Um, but as like as I, mentioned, as I mentioned, the service, you know, if the looking at the activities that the the resident or the applicant has, or in this the medical student applying to um, yeah. residency program, the activities, the leadership that they've had, and what kinds of things they were doing, and whether or not it truly speaks to is consistent with their interest, yeah. um, that their their stated interest. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, there, it's it's not easy. It's certainly yeah. not not an easy task. Um, but but certainly it's it's important to look broad, you know, look, look yeah. holistically at the application. Uh, Tessie and Lindsay, um, any thoughts of what we can do as as a bigger field perspective? Let's say from like AHPM or H, I don't know, HBNA, but uh, like from a uh, let's focus on the physicians. And, and again, we're seeing. Hospice is also another one where hospice, we don't see yeah. that diversity. Yeah, so I, I let me chime in briefly here. So I teach this, you know, the geriatric fellows are required to have two hours of cultural competence uh, training every year. I hate that phrase, but uh, that's the requirement, and I teach it. And one of the images I show them is uh, what happens when you do a Google Images search for hospice. And what happens, you know, I pull up the pictures and, you know, there's a little bit of diversity there, but it sure doesn't reflect the diversity of our society. Mm -hmm. It sure doesn't. In an increasingly diverse society, it's overwhelmingly white. Um, and this is a challenge, you know, it's a challenge and uh, comes up in everyday patient care. I think about, you know, my own family, my mother-in-law, who's, you know, Asian American said, uh, um, uh, when her husband was dying, I don't want strangers in my house. People who don't look like me, people don't understand me, you know? Um, so huge need, not just in palliative care, also in hospice, also in geriatrics, which, you know, um, is over, uh, certainly doesn't reflect the diversity of our field. Um, so what can we do? Well, I think, um, you know, thinking of sort of big picture things. One thing that we did as a part of our project, which was kind of separate from partnering with institutions, is connecting with the Student National Medical Organization, um, sorry, Student National Medical Association, SNMA. Um, and so they have, you know, regional talks, um, chapters throughout the U.S. and are, um, it's an organization for underrepresented medical students and residents. And so that was a great way to connect with them, provide exposure to hospice and palliative medicine that they might not get at their institution. And that is, you know, doesn't require to make partnerships and connections with, um, you know, medical schools, which might be a little bit more difficult. So I think being intentional about connecting with those organizations and trying to reach, um, you know, the population of students is a great way to start. Yeah. I'll add that uh, the program that you guys are doing with the, the, the partnership uh, is a perfect example of mm. bringing a 
a skill set to a group of people who may not have exp- have a, had exposure to it. Um, so that I, I think that that's fantastic. I think what Alex brought up about what hospice looks like is that it's majority white is a huge problem. So not only are we having a pipeline problem with providers and clinicians who are you know underrepresented minority groups in medicine, we also have a problem with getting black and brown patients mm-hmm. interested and engaged in, in hospice. They're more likely to disenroll from hospice, uh, mm-hmm. even if they have been enrolled. Um, they're more likely to have end-of-life experiences that includes an ICU and lots of medications and all of those things. And mm-hmm. so we as a, as, a, as a group, as a society, have to do better uh, helping our black and brown patients even understand what palliative care and hospice is and all the wonderful benefits of it. And part of it is as a group, we have to walk into talking about racism because that is at the core of why a lot of our black and brown patients don't choose hospice and palliative medicine. The idea of withholding a service, you know, oh, you're you're just doing this as this as this the man, the system that always wants to give us less. So you don't want me to go to the ICU. You don't want me to get those extra cares uh, without really spending a lot of time talking about all the things that this, that we do add, all the support that hospice and palliative medicine can do. And so it, it might mean that, you know, more than just a two-hour cultural, you know, competency, because I also hate that word, Alex, uh, yeah. class, do we need to teach more about how do we... Um, engage black and brown people into wanting hospice and palliative care services. And Tessie, any any good programs and recommendations or like people that you think are doing a, a good job with that as far as either teaching it or implementing it? Um, I mean, palliative care, well, I would say that CAPSI and uh, Vital Talk are both leaning into this space uh, where they had not really been leaning into it before Mm -hmm. and are being more intentional about um, creating dialogue and talking maps that include talking about racism. Uh, Because a lot of, you know, when I think of the black and brown patients and their experience in, in hospitalized medicine, it is very different. Than, than what white patients experience. Um, we're more likely to have security called on us, to have you know, social contracts, um, mm-hmm. and less likely to have our pain be um, managed or even you know, uh, admitted, you know, assessed mm-hmm. or pain medications given. And so we need to start undoing some of that to mm-hmm. get black and brown people to build trust in the system. Um, and it comes from, you know, like I said, these organizations like CAPSI and, and Vital Talk are starting to do it. We also need to have more of this training in, in our medical schools, in our education mm-hmm. system. And I, I, would, I wonder if Freeba has thoughts about what, what we're doing on the education front just to get people to start thinking about mm-hmm. uh, the, what the Black experience is like in, in hospitalized medicine. What do you think, Reba? Well, you know, I think we're we're not we're not doing enough. I mean, I have somewhat of a um, a different lens in the sense that I'm at an HBCU, so that is, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of it's part of, central to the education. So certainly, we um, I think are doing a a good job of it. You know, kind of understanding that you know part part of you know as we as we're teaching and we're understanding you know the the social determinants of health. Understanding the cultural, you know, the, the the importance of honoring a person's, you know, cultural beliefs, and it's in in the in the con in this in this context as we think about families that traditionally will take care of each other and take great pride in um in in being able to take care of a family member throughout their, you know, particularly during a, a challenging illness, and so then to say, well, I've I, I've got I've I've got control of this. And so to allow, I think someone mentioned earlier, someone to then come in and um, support, so they don't, they don't, helping people to understand that this is not 
having someone to take your place, but rather to serve as an aid, as an, as a support and a complete mm -hmm. wraparound set of services that, that, you know, that, that offer that support. So to answer your question though, about how we're doing in the educational space, I think we um, are not doing it enough because what we're doing is more kind of one-offs to say, um, we acknowledge that culture is important. We're acknowledging, you know, kind of more as a checkoff to say we've had this session, right. but not to not integrating it throughout the education. So if you have, you know, even down to the patient who isn't taking their hyperten antihypertensive medications and it's just say, oh, well, this is just a non-compliant patient. Well, why? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, why, you know, are there are there certain are, are, because nobody really very few people want not to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so there is some kind of a barrier, whether it be related to education, resources, a previous experience with the healthcare system that makes mm -hmm. one, you know, more doubtful. And so, you know, so there needs to be more of an education around developing trust. There needs to be more of education around how we, um, how we work to understand better our patients, um, their motivations, uh, what, and, and so, so those are the kinds of things that we can do better, kind of mm -hmm. globally across healthcare education. Um, and I, and we're just, to date have not done it so well because we're compartmentalizing things yeah. too much, as, as opposed to kind mm -hmm. of integrating it throughout the education. I, I wanted to ask, um, going back to Lindsay, um, you started off with this brilliant research idea. Um, I'm so grateful that you did this study. Um, you know, working together with a great team. Uh, what's next on the research front? You know, how can we push, expose, um, uh, advance this issue um, from a research perspective? What other questions need to be asked and answered? I think that's a great question. Um, I guess it would be to see what, you know, partnering with these institutions looks like and if it really, you know, makes a difference in mm -hmm. the, you know, Black physicians who choose to specialize in hospice and palliative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I think importantly too, you know, we know that these primary palliative care skills are important for anyone who cares for someone with serious illness. So, mm -hmm. you know, looking at diversity as an issue in the field of hospice and palliative medicine, but also what are the changes that can be made across the field um, that can make a difference in these patients' lives. Mm -hmm. I was going to add the same thing, uh, Lindsay, is that, uh, you know, it's going to take such a while to build the pipeline of getting uh, Black uh, palliative care clinicians that mm -hmm. most of these patients are still being seen by their primary care physician if they're not going to go to palliative care service, uh, you know, if they're not going to access palliative care services. Mm -hmm. So how do we, I think our, our next goal is really to build up the skill set of primary care providers mm -hmm. um, while we wait to mm -hmm. build the pipeline of, right. um, of palliative care providers. Mm -hmm. So maybe the initial focus, there, there are so many areas to focus on. <laughs> um, Reba, from your perspective, one, one, what do you want us to focus on as a field, as far as a research perspective? Like, what do you think is the, like the big next for us? Sure. Yeah. No, actually, I was thinking the same thing, even when I was talking about, um, you know, kind of the, the primary care focus of, of some of the schools that are um, that were that are teaching high percentages of African-American and, um, and Latina students is that and, and residents is, you know, kind of looking at primary care and how I, I mean, that was my exact thought was building out the skill sets among primary care um, physicians while at the same time uh, increasing the exposure, you know, what can we do around increasing exposure um, and really beginning to um, study the approaches and the effectiveness of those those approaches as far right. as far as those exposures are and and what the outcomes are related to um, the uptake of interests in um, in in more specialized specializing in more palliative care or at least utilizing the um, utilizing the skill set. Uh, even just having the conversations to send the patients in the direction of the providers of um, hospice and palliative care uh, services. So, um, so I, I think I listed about three or four things. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> but as a focus, yes, yeah, certainly starting to build out the skill set among primary care physicians yeah. is is a great place to start. Yeah. Well, we certainly have a, a lot to to work on. Uh, 
as a field. Um, and I, I want to thank all three of you for joining us on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely love the paper. Um, and you know, I, I think it is, we've had a lot of wake up calls over the last couple of years, um, about what we need to do differently in the field. Uh, and I would say both geriatrics and palliative care and hospice mm -hmm. and yeah. medicine in general. Yeah. So, um, again, thank you for joining us. But before we leave, Alex, <laughs> Want to try a little bit more Beyonce? <laughs> Let's hear your inner diva come out. All right, here we go. Who, who runs the world? Who runs the world? Girls. This goes out to all my girls who's in the club rocking the latest, who will buy it for themselves and get more money later. I think I need a barber. None of these chicks can fade me. I'm so good with this. I remind you, I'm so hood with this. Boy, I'm just playing. Come here, baby. Hope you still like me. And if you hate me, my persuasion can build a nation endless. Power with our love we can devour. You'll do anything for me. Who runs the world, girls? 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 Well, thank you, Lindsay, Tessie, and Reba, for joining us on this podcast. It was an um, absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks for all the work that you do. Thank you to all our listeners for supporting the Jerry Powell Podcast and Archstone Foundation for your continued support. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>